This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Quickly I regained my senses. I dove for the chair, grasped it, and dragged it to a corner of the room. It was such fine ash, the angles carved with perfect precision. There was no other chair like it, not anywhere in the world. Stepping over to the battered table by the door, I snatched up a rag, then scooted back to the chair and wiped the water off its limbs. Then I returned to my workbench to consult the diagrams that had passed down countless generations to me. We were the bilers, the finest woodworkers and craftsmen in all of England. Our pieces had dovetailed joints, smooth finishes, and intricate etchings that no other man had ever been able to duplicate. The drawings and symbols were so ancient they were written on yellowed animal hide and inked in the maroon of old blood. In the top left corner of the hide was the image of a table adorned with elaborate symbols. Twenty years ago I made that table and gave it to Lord and Lady Ashburton of Avebury. Ten years ago I made the cedar chest, hinged it just so, and carved the symbols in ordained arrangements on the inner surfaces. I'd left the chair for last. It was the most difficult of the three items described on the hide. The symbols were so complex that it had taken me months to create them, often using tools of my own making. Now I stared at my creation. It was perfect. The etchings rose in bar relief. They curled and whirled. They overlapped. The symbols reached through my eyes into my brain. They tapped into that place where my soul fluttered. I scooped a metal plate from my workbench, then crouched in front of the chair. My fingers caressed the symbols I'd burned into the plate. Heat flowed from the symbols down my arm and crackled into my brain. I let the warmth rise over and through me, let it crash down like waves. Now was the time. Steady myself as best I could, I nailed the plate to the chair exactly at the midpoint between the two ends of the brace. With shaking hands, I lifted the ancient instructions, uttered the syllables inked at the bottom of the animal hide. I had no idea if my pronunciation was correct, for the letters were alien to me. I just did my best, based on what my father and grandfather had taught me. As I chanted the words, I imagined the faces of my brethren gazing at me with wonder, mesmerized by my mastery. Kulsi Patagan, Fatagan Dagon Daagan, Fatul Rahi Roa, I intoned. The oil lamp sputtered. Kulsi Fatagan Pahagan in Creechil Chikiglin. The light flashed a bright yellow. I cringed and squeezed my eyes shut, but still I continued from memory. Kulsi Cantatro Fibwip Little Kick. A bright light burned through my right eyelid. Pain exploded in my brain and careened around my skull. My eyes sizzled. Clutching my face, I sank to my knees, suppressing a scream. My right eye felt as if it had boiled over. Liquid oozed down my cheek. I gagged as the bile surged in my throat. The world slipped in and out of existence. Toppling over, I rolled to my side, hands clawing my forehead and cheeks, fingers smeared with the ooze of my eye. My left eye snapped open and I saw the abomination. Instantly, I knew it would have been better not to have seen it. The entire chair throbbed. The etched symbols beat like a thousand hearts. Light shattered the black of the room, overwhelming the flickering lamp. Above me, the moor yawned again, stretching greater than before. Lips pulled back into the night. The rain resumed, dripping like saliva. The stars shining through the downpour were sharp, sharp teeth, descending coming closer. And then came the eyes, glowing, red, of such dimensions I cannot describe them, like the eyes of a million insects glued into one, yet unlike the eyes of any creature I'd ever seen. Eyes that pulsed in time with a chair. Eyes that bore down upon me, and within their depths throbbed the symbols, the horrible symbols I'd carved. Eyes, infinite eyes. Part 1. The Infernal Machine 1. Dr. John Watson, October 1890, London
The night murmured. Leaves tossed themselves to the wet cobblestones of Baker Street.